Giuseppe Football Italia, 93, Q titles. Well, I'd just like to wish everyone a happy new year, 93. Um, I hope I have a good year. I hope uh, my year has been as good as the last six months. Everyone's went well for us. I hope I carry on um, winning for England and hopefully carry on towards the World Cup, as do everybody else in England. Um, I hope everything goes very, very well for Lazio and uh, carry on staying up there at the top, a third at the moment. And uh, we want to carry on that and stay as high as we can in 93. Uh, but more about that later. First this. Coming up, Roberto Baggio back in action and back on the goal trail for Juventus. Sampdoria's Christmas victory with champions AC Milan. And Roberto Mancini, hat-trick hero last weekend against Foggia. James Richardson goes behind the headlines to bring us all the week's news. Every goal from last Sunday's Serie A matches. There's your chance to win a trip to the Italian Cup final. And an old-style Italian club shirt. Gaza outlines his hopes for the new year. There's a special look at the top sides in Serie A B. And with Des Walker under fire in the British press, we hear the views of his Sampdoria colleagues before tomorrow's big clash against Juventus. And it's Juventus who kick off our action as Gary Bloom reports on last weekend's match with Parma. 1993 begins with the return of arguably the team's best player, number 10 Roberto Baggio, who's recovered from the rib injury he incurred while playing fatally in a World Cup qualifier in Scotland. Baggio's often been severely criticised by Juventus coach Giovanni Trapattoni, who wants more perspiration as well as inspiration from his captain. Well, Palmer are inevitably inspired by their Swedish international, Thomas Brolin, the player in the number 11 shirt. The team arrive in Turin without their captain, Lorenzo Minotti, who's suspended. Utility player Gabriel Pin is no stranger to this setting, he began his career with Juventus in the early 1980s. Well, 1992 was a vintage year for Palmer, but 1993 sees Roberto Baggio back for Juventus. Juventus enter the new year. Lovely layoff there by Muller. Viali given away. Corgi picked it up. Here's Pizzi down the left. Melli's made a run. Here is Melli. He's breached the Juventus defence. And Melli, who scored a goal against Juventus in the Italian Cup final at the end of last season, should have given his side the lead. This is a brilliant, incisive ball here by Fausto Pizzi. And Melli shot wastefully wide. Still Juventus nil, Parma nil. And Juventus' superior status has been heavily disguised. That time Viali gave away. A free kick. Well, you must stretch the credulity of the Juventus fans to see Viali playing in midfield. He really has earned the apprehension of most defenders in Europe, never mind Italy. Corgi standing over the ball. Zorato. Melli, oh goal, Jürgen Kohler, the German international tried to clear it with his head but only succeeded in looping his header over Peruzzi and Palmer are in front from a most unlikely source. This really was a curious goal, it was neither a header over his own crossbar nor a clearance away from his six-yard box. And five minutes before the interval, Palmer lead by a goal to nil. Just a point separates these two clubs in Serie A. 
Juve started today in fifth place, Palmer back in tenth. So a win for Palmer in this match, and remember they lead by goal to nil, could be very, very important in their attempts to secure another European place next season. Now, this looks more promising by Juventus. Roberto Baggio, Marocchi popping up on the left-hand side. Baggio, he's back with a goal! Juventus won, Palmer won. And how Juventus have missed their captain. Scored the winning goal in this fixture last year and returns to the side after that rib injury with what might prove to be a crucial goal. That's a good ball by Melli. And the bumpy surface directly responsible for Juventus conceding that corner. Muller unable to keep his feet. Corner then to Palmer. 1 1 the latest score. Number nine, Fausto Pizzi to take it. 2 1. Melli's done it again. The man who scored in the cup final scores what could prove to be the winning goal against Juventus. Thump in the face as he headed the ball over the goal line. Really Less than 10 on, minutes remaining for Juventus to find an equaliser. 2-1 they trail. Marocchi, Ravenelli, Di Kenya, stepping inside the challenge of Serato. Dino Baggio! It was too hot to handle. And quite rightly, Marco Bellotta in the Palmer goal, elected to divert the ball over the crossbar. Jürgen Kohler waiting on the edge Real of the penalty area now for Juventus, trying to get his head onto this corner. Kohler! Great stop by Balotta to deny the German. Conte puts the crossover, Ravanelli first to react. Marocchi now. Kohler again, brave save by Balotta. And Palmer will have a free kick. And Jürgen Kohler almost made amends for his own goal, which he scored just before half-time, by twice almost forcing an equaliser. That the second of two opportunities he had. Guerrera. Ravanelli. Viali pushed forward now in a more advanced role. And the danger, of course, is that Palmer could catch Juve on the counter-thrust. Oh, here's an opportunity! Roberto Baggio, Viali waiting in the middle. Viali! We've still got time for a winner, says Viali. And Juventus feel they just might find a match winner in Gianluca Viali. Brilliantly volleyed home. And Viali's goal-scoring instincts didn't let him down. Once Baggio had stolen clear of the Palmer defence, Viali was on hand, and Juventus right back in this game. Palmer playing with a neurotic caution now in the closing stages of the game. Juventus seeking a third goal, which would win them both points. Now, is this the opening they've looked for? Oh, how did he miss? Roberto Baggio can only sit and wonder how that one stayed out. He scored much harder goals throughout his career, and this should have proved to be the winner. Got in front of Matricano, but scooped the ball over the bar. Well, tomorrow it's Juventus against Sampdoria, live at a quarter past one. 
A full preview later, but first, let's catch up with Sampdoria's recent form, starting with their rearranged match against AC Milan just a couple of days before Christmas. The championship favourites looked shaky earlier, allowing Attilio Lombardo this sight of goal, but his shot lacked power. On 28 minutes, the moment every club in Serie A were dreaded. Albertini's free kick, Marco Simone's header, 1-0 to Milan. The Sampdoria skipper Roberto Mancini decided on a direct approach in search of the equaliser, but his finish didn't match the run. Spurred on by that escape, Milan pressed for the second, but as Forest fans will testify, that kind of cross will never beat Des Walker. Injury time in the first half, and Sampdoria finally breached the Milan defence. A magnificent cross from Lombardo, and the perfect finish from Ivano Bonetti. The land keeper sent one way, then the other, but Rossi had no chance. 1-0. But in the second half, Milan upped the gear. The Dutch duo, Rijkaard and Hullet combined, so Milan took the points. Sampdoria played well, but not well enough, and the reigning champions were more than happy with the result. That defeat meant Sampdoria were without a win since November, so they were hoping to turn things round against Foggia on the first game of 1993. Gary Bloom reports. One of the most charitable defences in Italy these days belongs to Sampdoria in blue. Manini number two and Lana number three make a real pig's ear of that Foggia raid. Lana's tackle on Kolivanov would grace Twickenham rather than the Luigi Ferrari Stadium. Biagioni scores his fifth penalty of the season. When Sampdoria lose the ball, they're in big trouble. They have five defenders here to cope with four Foggia attackers, but Bresciani still manages to score. Sampdoria have opted for a new zonal defence this season, which has produced one of the worst defensive records in Serie A. A 50-yard pass kick-started Sampdoria into real urgency. Watch out for number 10, Mancini. A hop, a skip and a jump before a goal. Mancini deserves a good deal of praise for this goal. He's not the tallest of players in the team, yet won this aerial duel to give his team possession in a position of some danger to Foggia. The finish was sheer class. If Mancini hit that one sweetly, watch out for his second goal. A raking move involving Bertorelli and Serena. Sampdoria's attacking instincts were gradually flowering. Mancini's shooting was of the highest order. Into the second half now, Bertorelli to Lombardo. Just a hint of handball as Mancini helps the ball into the penalty area before claiming his hat-trick. It's Mancini's first ever hat-trick in Serie A and the first in Serie A by a Sampdoria player since Trevor Francis managed it ten years ago. Twelve minutes left and Mancini's red-letter day was spoiled by another soft goal. Bianchini scores on the back post. Bianchini was playing in the fourth division a year ago. He doesn't often get forward, he's a centre-half. But with this goal, he halved the points. It ended 3-3. Foggia extend their unbeaten run to five matches. And we'll be hearing from Des Walker and his Sampdoria colleagues later. But after the break, it's competition time and Gazza's win. Time for a long overdue look at the Italian sports press. Now you may remember that as we left things last year, uh, discord and bitterness were rife and argument was very much the order of the day, particularly where Rude Hullet and Milan were concerned. Well I have in my hand a piece of paper that tells me that the Christmas cheer has worked wonders. 
Berlusconi makes the peace with Hullet. This is from last Wednesday, in fact, and in fact they got it slightly wrong. It was Hullet who grabbed the microphone at the end of a long press conference to explain to a stunned audience, which included President Berlusconi himself, that he wanted to make up with the club. We've had our tiffs like any husband and wife would, he said, but I've now made my decision and I want to stay with the club. I'm going to renew my contract. Now, for those of us who can remember Hullet's comments about Milan over the last four months, and particularly in December with, if you recall, headlines like Hullet Poisons Milan, this is an about-face of positively franco baresiesque proportions. As yet, there's been no official comment from Milan, but uh, Berlusconi himself at the press conference said, eh, with the hairstyle that Hullet's got, he must be the wife of the pair. Well, down in Florence, meanwhile, they waited until the season of goodwill was safely out of the way before springing the New Year's big surprise story upon us. And here it is in the Gazzetta della Sport from Monday. Firenze via Redice. Redice is out. The coach of Fiorentina fired by the president after the club's home defeat by Atalanta. After the game, Vittorio Cecchigori, the Fiorentina vice president, stormed into the dressing room and had a 40-minute argument with Radice, after which the coach was fired. The reasons given are that he used the zone defence too much and that his team selection was poor. Despite our suggestions, explained Cecchigori, he always picked the wrong team, which certainly enlightens those of us who were under the misapprehension that choosing your own squad was part of a coach's job. As you may expect, the papers here in Italy took a pretty dim view of this. Uh, <coughs> summed up, in fact, by this uh, article in the Corriere della Sera, the influential Milan newspaper. Uh, the ultimate madness, they call it, not to be confused, of course, with that record we all received for Christmas. They tell us in that article that even the mayor of Florence has complained about the dismissal of the coach, but there are those who support the Cecchi Gori's position. Franco Zeffirelli, for one, the director of Hamlet fame. Radici's replacement is Aldo Agroppi, who six and a half years ago took Fiorentina into the UEFA Cup. Since then, he's been a television pundit and he certainly picked up a nice line in soundbites. I'm not Aldo of Nazareth, he told the Corriere della Sport. Don't expect miracles. I'm not a yes man either. If Cecchi Gori wants to play coach, then I'll play president. There are those who'd probably say he'd make a better job of it too. In the meanwhile, on Wednesday, he got off to the best possible start as a coach in Fiorentina's New Year mini-tournament, beating uh, Inter Milan 1-0 and Leeds United 2-0. Next up on the chopping block, according to this week's papers, is Vujadin Boskov of Roma. And in fact, Roma have to face Atalanta tomorrow. Dino Zoffo of Lazio is now out of danger, according to reports that the club has now extended his contract to 1994. Lazio are having a good stretch right now. They've moved up to third place in Serie A, even without the services of Paul Gascoigne. He's been absent for about a month. In fact, they've been doing so well without him that, according to the papers, it's likely that he'll miss Sunday's game to make space for Karl Heinz Riedler. But don't expect Karl Heinz Riedler to figure too much in Lazio's long term plans. The big story at the moment is that they're going to send him up to Juventus in return for their Italian striker Gigi Casiraghi. Juventus have certainly expressed great interest in having Riedler's services next year, but their main target for the summer market is apparently still Dennis Bergkamp, the Dutch player who apparently is unofficially signed already for Milan. There are those who go so far as to say that Viali's move to the midfield is all just to create space for the arrival of Bergkamp up front. Certainly brains all over Italy have boggled trying to work out just why Viali has been moved to this playmaker role. There was even a survey in the Gazzetta della Sport which discovered that a massive 94% of fans disapproved of Viali's move to midfield. Well, I went up to his old club Sampdoria early in the week to ask his ex-teammates what they thought of the whole affair, particularly since they're going to be facing him tomorrow. You can hear their reactions to that later in the show. Also, coming up later, we have our usual tete-a-tete with Paul Gascoigne and a competition. But first, though, the first part of our goals roundup from last Sunday's Serie A action. Lazio travelled to Ancona without the injured Paul Gascoigne and Karl Heinz Riedler and had to contend with near Arctic conditions as well as a side fighting to stay up. Agostini should have done better here. And Kenna threatened again moments later, but Fiori saved comfortably. At the other end, a Signori corner almost produced the first own goal of 1993. Then on the half-hour mark, Lazio opened the scoring, Diego Fuzer netting his sixth of the season. Fuzer was dealt a helping hand from both the pitch and some reckless goalkeeping. Well, in true tradition, Ancona fought back in the second half, catcher with the first effort. And then the pass to Pecoraro, who failed to take advantage of his good fortune. The same player tried his luck again from long range. Inevitably, Ancona's search for a goal left them exposed in defence. First Fuzer and then Signori were denied by fine goalkeeping from Michilo. Signori did manage to find the net with a quarter of an hour left of the game. Unfortunately for him, the goal was ruled out for offside. 
But the league's top goal scorer wasn't to be denied a New Year goal, converting with supreme confidence five minutes from full time. Thomas Dahl set up the chance for Signori's 14th of the season. And it was Signori again two minutes later, providing the cross for Vinter to score Lazio's third of the game. It was perhaps appropriate Vinter should score, given the driving snow. It finished 3-0, Lazio move up to joint third in Serie A. The visit of Udinese in the stripes to Brescia was only their third in Serie A. On loan goalkeeper Di Sano did well there. Udinese possess in the Argentinian Abel Balbo, one of Serie A's unlikely heroes. They're going close. Balbo's persistence was rewarded in the 38th minute with a penalty after he was brought down by Paganin. It was Balbo's electrifying pace which enabled him to race past the cumbersome defender before he was eventually fouled. The striker's emphatic penalty conversion took his total to 13 for the season. Two minutes later, Udinese should have made it 2-0. Mate had plenty of time in which to shoot, but that didn't prove to be too much of an advantage. Brescia finally got going in the latter stages of the first half. Paganin almost making amends for that penalty with a header. But in injury time, the Romanian, Georges Hagi, who else, fired home the equaliser. The Romanian now has four for the season, and each goal has been executed in similar fashion. 1-1 then at half-time, but Brescia held the upper hand in the second half. Radu Choi is showing the sort of finishing which led to his transfer to Italy from Romania three years ago. Radu Choyo has so often flattered to deceive. Perhaps with his third Italian club, he'll finally fulfil his potential. Udinese did manage a late rally, but Desideri's splendid strike was kept out by the frame of the goal. Desideri denied a goal and Udinese denied a draw. It finished 2-1 to Brescia, their first win in five matches. Sardinia hasn't seen such poor weather for eight years, and Torino, in white, might have felt more at home in the snow than a Cagliari side which had won five of their last seven games. After the initial scramble in their penalty area, Torino produced the first real shot of the game through Coes. Both Cagliari and Torino possessed the league's best defensive record, so it came as no surprise to see a contest devoid of goal-scoring chances. Though Mussi tried his best to unlock Canary's defence, Yelpo did enough to clear the ball. Canary eventually reached their opponent's penalty area, Casa Grande getting it away, before he moved to the other end of the field, but aimed his header straight at the goalkeeper. Canary's Herrera then spotted Marco Johnny off his goal line. The last incident of the first half belonged to the home side. Fester's fine header was matched by Marco Johnny's goalkeeping. In the second half, Enzo Schifo's long-range effort was saved by Yelpo. Before the crowd caught their first glimpse of 19-year-old Uruguayan, Marcelo Tiquera, who was making his Serie A debut. Calori, of course, possessed the talents of another Uruguayan, Francescoli, who almost set up a chance here. Minutes later, in an almost identical move, Francescoli delivered the centre, which fell harmlessly away from the danger area. The one-sided second half culminated with his free kick from Pushedu, which failed to alter the game's outcome. Cagliari nil, Torino nil. A nagging thigh injury kept Paul Gascoigne out of action last weekend, but there's still plenty for him to tell us about. Hi, well, yeah, I'm to talk about my uh, week. Um, as you say, last you had a great win against Ancona um, in terrible weather, snow on the ground and everything, and they pulled off a fantastic victory, 3-0. Uh, just shows, you know, last year can win games uh, without me, and they've been doing that throughout the season. Uh, I've had injuries and that, and uh, it's great to see them going on strong. Uh, it takes a lot of pressure off me, you know, to see the players 
doing really, really well. And uh, Signori doing fantastic. Um, the week I've had uh, has been too good since I arrived. Um, but that's in the past now, you know, my house got broken into and the, they took a few things uh, a little bit upset about. Um, but that's no problem. It's, uh, as long as the family wasn't in the house when it happened. Um, but I had a good Christmas. Um, stayed in a lovely hotel. Um, Sopwell, little mention for them. <laughs> I stayed in there with uh, Cheryl and me and Bianca and we had a fantastic time. I really enjoyed it. It was good seeing the kids open the presents. Um, I mean me. <laughs> um, New Year was good, you know. As of, um, I pulled a little problem in my leg so he said I could go home for a couple of days. Uh, it was good to spend New Year. You know, I, I went away to Shell for a couple of days. It was really, really nice. Uh, and now it's back, back to the real stuff and uh, looking forward to the championship. And I think it's just a matter of hopefully uh, Milan dropping points so we can creep up on them. There's still a few games to go and uh, we hopefully we can get the points. Well, things also in Italy, uh, you know, you can be a manager or one day the next minute you're fired. It's as simple as that. Um, the coach of Fiorentina has gone through a rough time. Not just a rough time, but he's just been fired. Um, so he's looking for a new job. So it's a good new year to him. Um, the room, my coach is under pressure. Um, but what I'm pleased to say is that Zoff is, I think he's been given a new contract in 94. Yeah, I'm pleased for him because uh, he's worked very, very hard. Um, he's a nice man. Um, he is when he picks us. Um, I don't know what he's like when he isn't. Uh, but he's a nice man and I'm pleased to see him get a new contract. And I hope everything goes well for everybody back home in 93. Have a good new year. Ciao, Arriva Dirty. Welcome back. Tomorrow's big match preview coming up, but first, the rest of last Sunday's Serie A goals. Fiorentina's clash with Atalanta in the white was always going to prove uncomfortable, if only for the rumours concerning the future of Fiorentina coach Gigi Radici. Fiorentina's poor defensive record is the key to Radici's problems at the club. The home side dominated the match. Battistuta was denied its eighth goal of the season by the brilliance of Ferron. Atalanta riding high after a promising start to the season threatened through Gantz. Here he is again, but his shot lucked power to beat the goalkeeper. Fiorentina's defensive deficiencies were exposed in the second half yet again. Rambaudi's pass allowing Perone to finish in style. 1 0 to Atalanta. According to the leading soccer experts, only Peroni's age stands before him and a call-up for the international team. Peroni's 32 years old. One of Fiorentina's famous internationals, Brian Laudrup, almost produced the equaliser before another, Stefan Effenberg, saw his long-range effort saved by Ferron. The home side penned Atalanta into their own penalty area for the last 20 minutes. Bayano somehow squandered this opportunity. Then, from a Brian Laudrup corner, Carnes Scholli missed the target from five yards. Laudrup again provided the cross for Batistuta's flying attempt at goal. The two imports combined almost to perfection on this occasion, and fortunately, Batistuta's header off target. Atalanta leave Florence with two points. Coach Radici also leaves Florence, sacked just hours after the game. Inter faced Genoa in white without the German Sammer. He was dropped and Darko Panchev was relegated to the substitutes bench. And the home side took the lead barely five minutes in. Battistini and marked on the far post, converting for his fourth of the season. Ciaccone making his return following a four-match absence was keen to impress his new coach Gigi Maifredi and was in fine form, keeping out Inter here. Then Branco's splendid cross produced this pitiful exhibition of finishing from Fortunato and then Paducci. Inter coming into the new year with two successive defeats should have doubled their lead just before half-time. Igor Shalimov, the culprit there. Shalimov then set up Rubin Sosa, returning after injury, but Tocconi denied him. The last effort of the first half came Genoa's way, Zenga pushing away Fiorin's strike. Early in the second half, Inter scored their second of the match. Rubin Sosa firing from a standing position 
following Bianchi's cross. Four Genoa defenders failed to clear the ball and paid the ultimate price. Inter appeared to fall asleep as Genoa endeavoured to claw their way back into this match. Ruotolo denied by Zenga here. Then the ever-impressive Padovano race clear and after being driven wide chose the wrong path to goal. Iorio then crossed for Ruotolo who again went close before Padovano was unlucky to see this effort striking upright. Inter managed to wake up in time to seal the victory, Shalimov finding an unmarked ferry to score goal number three. The replay shows Ferry in an onside position once the Russian had released the ball. If anyone deserved a goal, then it was Padovano, but Zenga thwarted the striker again. And from Padovano's corner, Zenga saved from Skoravi. With seven minutes to go, Inter made it 4-0. Shalimov punishing poor defensive play to produce a scoreline which more than flattered the home side. Inter, under the guiding light of former Genoa coach Osvaldo Bagnoli, said after the game if there was a match he didn't want to win by such a big margin, then this was it. 4-0 to Inter, they move up to second place in Serie A. Pescara in orange had never won in Naples. Roberto Policano was soon giving them a reminder of their poor form against Napoli and not to expect too much this time either. The star of the game was number 11 for Napoli, Daniel Fonseca. Medical opinion said he shouldn't have played because of an ankle injury. Fonseca took 16 minutes to puncture Pescara's defence, which has hemorrhaged goals this season. That's nine now for the season for the Uruguayan international. Zola's carefully weighted pass pushes Pescara into full retreat. Fonseca's strike is low and accurate. The Pescara defenders will still be having nightmares about Daniel Fonseca, who was looking for his second goal before half-time. If only Napoli could convert more of their chances, they might be further away from the relegation zone. When Pescara threatened to score, they handed possession back to Napoli, quite literally here. If only the goals would have been five foot higher, Napoli would have had five themselves. Kripa missed that one. Sliskovic then threatened to embarrass Napoli's domination of the game. Borganovo just a pace behind the ball. Fonseca was soon claiming his second goal of the match, a suspicion of offside before he scores his tenth for Napoli. He scored half Napoli's goals this season. Pescara ploughed on down the right-hand side, Palladini's ball to Rigetti's head. Zola and Policano then linked up to put Pescara's defence on red alert. Fonseca chasing a hat-trick was oozing confidence. That was until he was in his shooting stride. Just two then for Fonseca as Napoli ease away from the foot of the table. Match of the day in Italy was Milan in white, away to Roma. Six minutes in, Milan reduced to ten men as Baresi hauls back Bonaccina. Well, that's the referee's interpretation of the incident. The key to the debate is Baresi's captain's armband, yanked from his bicep to his forearm. The foul was interpreted as Bonaccina in a goal-scoring position. Buoyed on by having an extra player, Roma attacked. Carnivali went fishing for a goal with this extravagant chip. Argentinian Claudio Canizia was soon forcing Milan back. With a defender light, the champions soon made a switch, bringing on Nava for Masada. Milan were without European Footballer of the Year, Marco van Basten. So last year's winner, Jean-Pierre Papin, took over the number nine jersey. But not van Basten's extraordinary goal-scoring powers. What Milan lacked in numbers, they made up for in sheer class. Ruud Hullet may have had his differences with Milan recently, but this was a real kiss and make-up goal. Hullet has only started six league games for Milan, but in those half-dozen games, he scored five times. This was a beautifully contrived and beautifully executed goal. Roma's busy, inventive winger Thomas Hessler was roaming creatively through a maze of white shirts. Nobody was on hand to provide the finishing touch on the back post. 
Sometimes you don't have to hit them hard to score. Sometimes the goalkeeper can do you the odd favour. But Ossi in the Milan goal, almost ending up with a red face. It's an unconventional save by Rossi, but it was enough to dampen down Roma's burning ambition to win a point. Milan win by one goal to nil, their seventh consecutive away victory, another record in Serie A. Well, those results leave AC Milan even more firmly ahead in Serie A. Eight points clear of local rivals Inter. But Lazio's two successive victories put them into third place ahead of Torino and the surprise packets Atalanta. Pescara are firmly rooted at the foot of the table along with Ancona. Despite their 2-0 win over Pescara, Napoli is still in trouble along with Udinese and Roma. Bebi Signori's strike against Ancona puts him top in the goal scoring charts above Abel Balbo. The injured Marco Van Basten is still third on 12 with five players bunched just below. Serie B's game of the day was between leaders Reggiana against the early pace setters Cremonese. Reggiana broke the stalemate in the 78th minute when the informed striker Marco Paccioni connected with Morello's cross. Three minutes later, Reggiana extended their lead when Gualco swung an arm at Paccioni in the box. and Sacchetti converted the penalty. Two minutes from time, Reggiana keeper Bucci conceded his first goal for 763 minutes, when the fullback Petroni scored a consolation goal for Cremonese. The final score, 2-1 to Reggiana. So that win confirms Reggiana as the runaway leaders of Serie B. Undefeated, five points clear of the chasing pack and looking as hard to beat in their division as the Milan are in Serie A. Venezia and Lecce are neck and neck leading the chase for the other three promotion places, but the competition is tight with only four points separating eight teams. But we finish today back in the top flight. Atalanta could improve their position still further by beating Roma and Gaza's Lazio must fancy their chances against Brescia. AC Milan plays Cagliari, and you can see extended highlights of that match in Gazzetta Football Italia next Saturday. But our featured game tomorrow, kicking off at 1.30, sees Sampdoria take on Juventus. James Richardson has been to Genoa to find out the mood in the home camp. It's a bright sunny day here in Genoa and most of the town seems to have come out here to Sampdoria's training ground in the mountains to the south of the city. Now this is the place that according to some English newspapers Des Walker is having a bit of a disastrous time. However, there is a theory that you can't believe everything you read in the papers and so we've decided to come ourselves and find out A, how the team is getting along in its preparations for tomorrow's big game with Juventus and B, more importantly, what they themselves think about the whole Des Walker story. Des himself denies ever reading the English sports press and so claims to have no knowledge at all of the articles. Others, though, both inside and outside the team, are quick to spring to his defence. Secondo me, Walker è un giocatore veramente bravo. Ha trovato era partito molto bene, poi ha trovato qualche difficoltà, ma adesso piano piano sta superando. Penso che sia un'esagerazione così quello che hanno scritto i giornali inglesi. Penso che tutto sommato, se guardassero bene le partite, vedrebbero che Walker is disputing a good championato. You know, the team had some problems lately, as, uh, as uh, we talked about uh, yeah, before. But Walker is doing well, he's playing well, and uh, I mean, you cannot say that it's uh, uh, Walker who made us uh, lose a lot of points. Absolutely not. He's doing fine, he's a great professional, and uh, we are happy with him. No problem at all. Ma secondo me non è assolutamente un acquisto sbagliato perché 
si è, anche, si è ambientato subito bene, e anzi ha portato un po' di allegria nello spogliatoio e anche a livello di squadra mi sembra che si sia integrato benissimo. Sono queste critiche che appunto hanno ripreso i giornali inglesi non si è assolutamente parlato di tagliarlo, ecco, di farlo tornare a casa, ecco, una cosa che, che qui non è assolutamente venuta fuori, ha sorpreso un po' tutti. Ecco. Da lui ad esempio Domenica ha giocato benissimo, ha sbagliato Mannini. Sotto Port, cioè, lui non ha che... Io me lo vedo bene. Anzi, è stato, è stato il numero uno della campagna acquisti della Samp. Tutti lo attendavamo con te reazione. È un grande, sta giocando bene. Non, non vedo perché lo devono criticare. Well, Sam Doria may be happy with Des Walker, but that's not to say that there aren't problems here at the club. Undeniable ones, in fact, given that the side hasn't won since last November. It's the coach's job, of course, to try and sort all that out. And so Sven Goran Eriksson has identified the three main problems behind Sam Doria's recent record. One thing is in uh, when we attacking that we create a lot of occasions every game lately, but we scoring few goals on in the occasions we we creating. Second thing is uh, that uh, free kicks corners we losing too many goals. Third thing is that uh, when we have the ball we have it uh, have the ball in the defense we. We play it up to the midfield or up front and when we coming when we push up the team when we lose it the opponents <laughs> scoring a lot of goals against us three things we must uh, try to resolve for uh, for Sunday against Juventus well according to the papers here in Italy the good news for Sampdoria right now is pretty much limited to their captain Roberto Mancini or Bobby goal as he's somewhat predictably called around these parts his hat-trick on uh, Sunday against Foggia certainly bears that out turning a 0-2 disastrous scoreline into a winning position for Sampdoria and in fact taking his goals total for the 11 games he's played so far to eight despite their captain's prowess though Sampdoria have managed just two points from their last five games in the light of Ericsson's comments then, I asked Mancini to try and explain Sampdoria's recent troubles. L'anno scorso avevamo Seresio, Catane, Cebonetti, Dario, che erano alti, quindi di testa difficilmente ci facevano gol. Quest'anno purtroppo non li abbiamo più, Catane ci è infortunata e quindi è chiaro che soffriamo, forse dobbiamo stare un po' più attenti. Da noi erano andate bene per un po' e poi chiaramente vengono fuori gli errori. Poi siamo anche un po' sfortunati ultimamente, anche se secondo me non meritavamo di perdere le partite che abbiamo perso. Quindi no, secondo me non c'è da preoccuparsi più di tanto. Poi è chiaro che in attacco uno può creare tante palle, però è difficile farle, metterle sempre tutte in rete. Mancini is now having to fill the vacancy left in the Sampdoria attack by Gianluca Viali's departure for Juventus. In their eight years together at the club, Viali and Mancini took Sampdoria to its greatest successes, an Italian championship in 1991 and the final of the European Cup at Wembley last year. The two players were known as the Twins, together the symbols of Sampdoria, but Mancini denies that his first game against his old teammate will affect him too much. Per me no. Per lui? Eh, perché io sono rimasto qua, quindi non ho nessun problema. Per lui penso che di sì, perché tornare nello stadio che l'ha visto protagonista per otto anni penso che sia un po' di emozione, anzi penso tanta, quindi speriamo. Voi siete sentiti in questi giorni? Sì, di... ma noi ci sentiamo spesso. E lui che cosa ha detto? Eh niente, ha detto che mi marca, quindi stare attento. To be honest, the expected fuss over the Shaven One's return to Sampdoria has been rather overshadowed by another story, Juventus' decision to move Gianluca Vialli to a more midfield role. This castration, and I quote, of Italy's leading striker has so far drawn derision, bewilderment and outrage in equal measure. But here at Sampdoria, they're taking a more relaxed view about it. I'm curious to, to <laughs> see <laughs> Vialli play in the midfield. Uh, I've never seen it, but uh, for sure he's a great player. He can do also that. I don't really think it makes a lot of difference. I think um, a forward of um, Vialli's calibre, he will always score goals and he'll be looking to go score goals. So he's got the same danger value to the team. And I think you always, you always got to watch him and coming from deep, it could be even more dangerous because you're not actually standing next to marking him. He can come in on the blind side of you. So I think he's still a very, very threat, very, very big threat. Secondo me è sbagliato che Viali giochi in mezzo al campo. È molto più forte quando gioca davanti perché per i difensori è molto difficile marcarlo perciò ha molte più possibilità di far vincere la propria squadra se gioca davanti, se gioca dietro perde in capacità di offensiva insomma. The 
The radical change of Viali's position has been taken by many as a symptom of the great confusion that the string of poor results they've had has caused at Juventus. As he showed against Parma, though, he's still dangerous when he does go forward, although what impressed Eriksson the most from that game was the spectacular return of the Juventus captain, Roberto Baggio. He's very cold uh, when he sees the goal. Uh, and he needs very little space. Of course, we must be pay a lot of attention to him, but not only him, even Viali, no little. Siamo tutti delle persone abbastanza intelligenti per capire che domenica è determinante per il nostro proseguo in campionato e per poter arrivare in Coppa UEFA. Perciò ci metteremo tutta la voglia, tutta la grinta di cui disporremo. So, an awful lot to look forward to tomorrow. Of course, there's the return of Gianluca Vialli to the club that made him famous. But above all, after all that talk, a chance to see just how well Des Walker can get on against some of Italy's finest forwards. Sampdoria against Juventus here in Genoa tomorrow afternoon.